real quick. Uh, I uploaded this video actually today. It is uh, April 18th. And I realized about an hour after it had been in live, uh, two of the comments that I noticed right away, there may have been more, but two I'm going to point out. They were One of them was from Al Anonymous, uh, and the other one was from Andrew Ralph Morton. You guys were spot on. They corrected me because I made a mistake in my description as to what I thought would happen or what I thought had happened, okay? Totally open to criticism, but it was a big enough mistake that I thought it was worth pulling the video down, editing that and re-uploading, but I don't want people to think that I didn't have people guiding me and helping me to tell me, hey, I, I accidentally said something incorrectly, right? So pay attention to the end of the video and I will uh, break it down where I made a mistake and what I said incorrectly. Well, today we are going to be changing a compressor on this unit. This is a six ton, I believe. Previously, it had been diagnosed with a bad compressor. It's grounded, but we don't know why. So we got to kind of approach that with uh, caution and try to figure out what caused this compressor to die. So we're going to start by uh, recovering the gas, getting that out of there, open up the electrical, investigate that and kind of just go through everything. All right, so like I said, the compressor's grounded. We know that much, but we don't know what caused it. I had a hunch, and so I opened up, I wasn't the one that diagnosed this, but I opened up this contactor, and this is the compressor contactor, and it's all burnt inside. So my running theory is that it's single phased. It's a three phase. You can see it's just all black in there, down here. So my running theory is, is that we single phase the, uh, the um, compressor, but we'll have to evaluate as we go through the unit. Currently vacuuming down the recovery cylinder so we can recover the charge. The condenser's in pretty good shape. We went ahead and pulled the top off the unit because these dryers are always a chore to get to. So to make it easier, we can just hop in there, get that done. Um, you can see that the technician that diagnosed it pulled the Molex plug off and we just taped it up temporarily. So, um, again, we don't know what caused it to go bad, but the compressor that I got is a ZP61, so that's correct. This guy's from 2012. I'm hoping it's not an oil-related issue. This guy does have the fixed orifice metering devices, so we don't know. This is just gonna be a chore, for sure. But, all right, well, we're just gonna start sanding things up. Um, we gotta check that crankcase heater, too. We can't really do a whole lot. We can sand it up, get the contactor changed, and then we still gotta recover the charge. All right, what we're gonna do is we wanna test, we're testing the crankcase heater right now. Um, I wanted to see if it was any good, and it doesn't look like it is. So that's a bummer. I'm hoping it's not an oil-related failure on this compressor. Um, so let's go ahead and test for the grounded situation real quick. And we clearly have continuity to ground. You can see I'm just on one of the terminals. So this guy is definitely bad. So as we're taking it out, we'll kind of look at everything. We know we have a crankcase heater, which I don't have. So hopefully I can pick one out or pick one up where I'm at. But we're going to continue right now. We're just trying to recover the gas. All right. Looks like we're right at about 12 pounds of gas recovered. So we got that. Now, um, we, it's got just a little bit of vapor left in it, but we um, can't get the bolts out for the compressor. They're stuck in there. They're just spinning on, both of these on this side are just spinning. So what we're gonna do is try to unsweat the tubes and then tilt the compressor back and hopefully put pressure on it so that way those things will come out because the two on this side came out no problem. It's kind of strange. On the plus side, it really doesn't smell very burnt. That's why I'm hoping that this just happened internally because of a single phase situation and it didn't blast contaminated oil all through the system. Because this is gonna be a pain because we have fixed orifice metering devices and there's no real way to clean those except for to change the whole evaporator. So let's hope it's not that bad. At this point, we're gonna go ahead and unsweat these real quick 
and then work on getting that compressor out. When you're brazing on these units, you gotta be careful because the air can suck, or the smoke can suck into the building, set off duct detectors and different things. This one actually doesn't have monitored duct detectors. There's one right there. And also, you gotta be careful about flame outs. There can be flame outs on these things, so you gotta watch out. All right, we're good on that one. Last one. Rosebud tips make it easy. The last time I was brazing, I was too lazy to go get my rosebud. Would have been a smart decision. Okay, now we got that out. So now the goal is to try to put pressure on the compressor and get these bolts undone. Went ahead and got a, uh, a long driver so we can just blast on this and hopefully pop it out. But it's weird because it's just, just spinning. And it's not coming out. There's no nut on the bottom, so hopefully it'll just come out. crazy we might have to cut that thing off that's so bizarre there's usually not a nut it's usually just threads going through huh. so we got a crescent wrench under there let's see if this will apply the needed pressure that's bizarre nothing Dang it, that back one's gonna be a pain to cut. This one would be easy. We have determined that it's a rib nut on the bottom and it's spinning. So we know we can cut this, no problem. The back one's gonna be a little tricky, but we'll probably just have to cut that one too. We'll get a Sawzall, cut the top off. This compressor can survive with just two bolts in the front. So that's what we're gonna do. All right, well, I managed to get myself inside of the unit. We gotta get to that corner. We already got the front one cut off. Now we just gotta get back here, get this one cut off. And then we'll get this guy out. We got the compressor out. I have never been a fan of riv nuts. They always strip. Those are stupid, stupid. But those are the only two that work now. Those two are cut off. We'll have to cut those bolts off. Got to get this dryer changed out. Once we get that swapped out, we'll be able to proceed. It was a little tight in the dryer, so we're trying to do some stuff out of the thing. So what we're doing is, is we're swaging a piece right here. Now, this is the Navac swaging tool. It's a great tool, but you do have to stop it midway and rotate it or it cracks the 3 8 pipes. So, we're swaging that, then we're gonna swage this, and as long as everything fits, we're gonna pre-braze the hard, difficult spots on the dryer out here, and then do the rest inside to make our life easier. All right, we just quickly poured oil out of this. Now, I'm not looking to see if it has the exact amount of oil. I just wanted to know if it was like a catastrophic oil loss, and it's not. There's still more oil in that. So I don't think we need to stress too much. And look at the oil's not even that dirty. Like it's, don't get me wrong. That's not a good color for POE oil, but um, it's not that bad. So we are gonna proceed with welding or brazing in the new compressor. Um, I think it's gonna be some sort of a mechanical failure or just a single phase situation. I don't think it's gonna be an oil loss. So my biggest concern was that the crankcase heater being bad caused refrigerant migration, which caused refrigerant flood back, which washed the oil out of the compressor. And it doesn't seem like that's the case. So we're gonna proceed. So we made it so that way we could get right back here and we're brazing it, we're flowing nitrogen through it. And uh, so now we just need to do this braze joint and the one on the top. Should be good. See, there's a little refrigerant in the system and the oil and the nitrogen's flowing out of that. So 
So the dryer's brazed in, that's good to go. We'll secure it and strap it once we get done brazing the compressor in. We have some of the uh, refrigeration technologies, Viper wet rag, which is just a heat blocking compound. We already used it to protect the dryer when we braze that outside to try to not burn it. And now we have some on the compressor. And again, it's flowing nitrogen through there. It's really important, but you gotta be careful too when you're flowing nitrogen because we have a, uh, pistons in this guy so you want to make sure it doesn't create too big of a pressure drop but we just got to sweat these guys and then we'll start on our evacuation all right this guy kind of popped out on him so we're going to push this in for him when he gets it hot enough there we go i'm holding it and then he's going to braise it can you see okay yeah all right it's good on the top just watch my hands probably good Hold it for a sec. Okay. And now he's gonna do the bottom. Don't think, oh, I guess I can push that one in too. So we're just doing a quick pressure test. Now these aren't normal digital gauges, but these should suffice. We don't need to get too crazy here. I don't think there's any leaks because we recovered pretty much the right amount of refrigerant. So um, we're just doing a quick pressure test and then we're going to get the vacuum hoses out and pull the evacuation. Also, before we're done, we're gonna change these Cormax fittings before we vacuum the system down. We have two brand new ones because whenever you have the system open, your best bet is to change those things. They always leak. All right, we are hooked up. Uh, for now, we're doing a one hose pull because uh, we should have thought about it, but we should have added a liquid line port to this guy because it doesn't have one, but that's fine. We're gonna go ahead and let this evacuate for now. We got the micro engage right there. Um, we're going to start changing the contactors on the other side and then get ready to put the top back on the unit. I usually just throw a towel over the micron gauge just so it's not getting hit by the sun. So we're dropping. It's taking some time, but that's fine. Um, I wanted to talk about the filter dryer. So I used a Sporlin catch-all. We used a 16.3 HH. The HH is going to be uh, wax removal, high wax removal. It's basically what you should be using after a grounded compressor replacement. And the HH, it's not an acid removal. I used to think it was an acid removal and I said that for a long time and it's not. It, the HH is actually for high wax removal because acids in the system that are created from moisture and heat and all that, right? Um, they uh, flow through the system and they're corrosive and they start, they can eat away at the, the, the wax or plastic winding covers on the insulation for the or the insulation for the windings of the compressor and it can start to eat that away and that's what the hh dryer is there to do is during the cleanup procedure it's there to clean all that wax up um, so just a food for thought kind of a thing but yeah we're just letting this guy run we've just got uh core depressors on here and yeah we're just letting it go so uh, i got the contactors replaced over here Come over here both contactors replaced New ones installed. Uh, instead of doing the lugs, I just put a connector because I had one of those red connectors. And yeah, that's it. So we'll just pull the condenser fan motor wiring back through and then uh, put the top on. But we gotta, we'll probably take a lunch and let the vacuum finish running. All right, what we did was we um, took the big hoses off, put the gauges on because we're gonna charge with the gauges. We're just pulling down the gauges to make sure they're nice and low. Um, we put the top on, we're starting to assemble the condenser fan motor and all that good stuff. <clears throat> Get the wiring run through. We can't source a crankcase heater right now, so I've just got connectors right there that we can connect later, those two. We'll deal with that later. But everything's looking pretty good. We got the top back on the unit. I got through here to push the wires through and then also to put this strap back on this dryer. So now the dryer's strapped and secured. We gotta make sure the the lines aren't going to rub out on anything. They're nice and good. So we should be good. I'm going to hop out now and finish putting this top on. All right, we are ready to charge this bad boy up. We are going to open up this one right here. We've already purged it. 14.2 pounds is what we're looking for. That guy's right there. And we're going to go ahead and open up the high side. Dump it into the high side. It should be coming back on the low side. That indicates that the metering device is allowing refrigerant to pass through it. That's good. And again, we're looking for 14.2 pounds. So we're at about one pound right now. So we're just gonna let that run for a little bit. Um, I got, like I said, I got in there and strapped the dryer. All is well. I gotta do something to secure these wires so they don't rub out. 
because we don't want them to uh, short on the discharge line or anything back in there. All right, we are gonna turn this guy on because it won't take any more than six pounds. Go ahead and fire it up. It's running in the right direction. We got it jumped out. We're just gonna add gas on the low side and get it up to our total refrigerant charge that we need. So we're just dumping it in on the low side at the moment. So we're just charging a little bit at a time, opening the low side. We don't want it to shut off on low pressure. Saturation temperature starting to come up because I'm not adding any refrigerant. We're almost at the full charge. So we're looking good so far. Now I'm gonna probe up with all my probes and everything and do a full evaluation on the system, but it's just easier sometimes to charge with the gauges. And I was having a hard time because it was dragging, pulling down. Uh, with just the one hose so I wanted to use the micron gauge in here so I could pull from both sides um, all right 12.2 is what we're looking for there we go so we've got the full charge in this guy on the plus side it's not pulling into a vacuum so that's good we're gonna let it run for a little bit and then we'll shut it down and probe up on it and you know evaluate the whole system never mind I was incorrect 14.2 is what we're looking for not 12.2 so still needs a little more refrigerant just adding it there we go now I got it at 14.2 so we're good we'll go ahead and get rid of that guy we're gonna let it run like I said for a little bit let it kind of stabilize out cool down the kitchen then we'll take uh, we're gonna clean up our messes which Will's kind of been doing already and uh, we'll let it stabilize out all right let's see if we can get a good little view of this this is looking really good um, it's still stabilizing out too got about four degrees superheat now if we click on that It'll tell you what it should be. Calculated target based on indoor wet bulb, outdoor dry bulb is five degrees. So we are right on the money with superheat. Subcooling looks pretty darn good and that's using discharge pressure too. Temperature splits about 20 degrees. Airflow is about 2400 CFMs. This is a six ton unit. I mean, 53,000 BTUs, sensible. You can see we have a very dry conditions outside. So 71,000, we're calling for 65. I mean, uh, this thing's doing everything it can. I don't see anything wrong. So what caused this compressor to go bad? I don't know at this point. We're definitely gonna be coming back with a crankcase heater for it. But other than that, this thing's running and it's kicking butt. Customer's gonna be stoked because we're coming into the warm season right now. So we're gonna let this run for a little bit and uh, that's pretty much it. We'll be coming back to put in a crankcase heater. I doubt I'll get any footage of that because that'll just be for another visit. We'll just slap it in there. So that's it on this one. We're gonna give the customer the keys, um, tell them to keep an eye on it. And I did also check the belt. The belt's nice and tight. Everything's good. Both contactors are installed, condenser fan motor. I mean, everything's brilliant on this right now. Uh, yeah, well, the thermostat should be calling too, so I should be able to pull those jumpers off. So yeah, that's it on this one. A messy side yard. Uh, I don't advise taking a grinder and cutting and shooting sparks when you have gas cans. Of course, I've moved them out of the way. First and foremost, let's look at this oil charge, 56 ounces. Pretty darn close. There's probably still a little bit of uh, oil in there, but don't think that oil was the problem, okay? All right, looking up here, um, not too much going on in here. There's some galling. You can kind of see the little round knobs, okay? And uh, looking in here, there's a little bit of galling in there. Nothing horrible. Uh, this is the fixed scroll. A little bit of galling in there. You can see the little round, look like tooling marks. But the real thing is this old hand coupling right here. This old hand coupling was broken and these little pieces were all down in the windings and that's more than likely in my opinion what shorted out was these pieces going down in there and just touching the windings vibrating probably getting stuck uh, in there and causing issues i mean actually the thing still rotates that's why it didn't seem like it was like a really nasty burn okay if you look at the bottom of the muffler plate right here i mean it doesn't look like there's very much overheating uh let's look at the floating seal I mean, really, there's not much overheating on the floating seal either on the top part of it. This is a 410A compressor out in the desert where it regularly gets above 100, well, uh, up to 120 degrees in the summertime, maybe 125 on the roof. Uh, the, you know, the, the uh, saturation temperature, the temperatures inside this compressor are extremely hot. And this thing looks pretty darn good, okay? So what caused the old hem coupling to break? Well... 
this is actually a re-edit because I said some things incorrectly and I posted the video and some people commented and they made some really good points. I'm 100% open to feedback, criticism, and I make mistakes sometimes. So originally I said I thought this was from refrigerant coming back and slugging the compressor and causing it to break. But the more than likely cause, and I said that incorrectly, is actually a flooded start. Now, in order for the refrigerant to come back and kill the compressor, it would take a lot because scroll compressors can do quite a bit, right? What would really have to happen is if they'd have to have a broken belt. If they had a broken belt and the thing was running for some reason without going off on low pressure, it could flood back to the compressor and cause some problems. But I really don't think that's the cause. That's pretty unlikely. More than likely because the crankcase heater had failed, right? Uh, the refrigerant was sitting in the compressor because it did happen over the winter like i had mentioned the refrigerant was sitting in the compressor on a startup it had a flooded start and something had to give you can't compress liquid refrigerant it just doesn't happen all right scrolls can't at least um and something has to give and i think the 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 weakest link here is this old ham coupling uh there's no repairing this this is broken um and that's it so we've already gone back out put a new crankcase heater on this guy and customers happy everything's good honky dory with that uh, i really really encourage people to pull these things apart it really does give you a lot of information also notice that this actually broke too right here i think this went like right in here somewhere because it had to give you the this is the spot so this guy right here will will pulsate back and forth and yeah that was busted too so yeah Liquid refrigerant is no joke, and uh, it's crazy, right? All right, well, that's it on this one. I am not perfect, right? And I, I said something incorrectly. Normally, I leave mistakes in videos all the time. This one, I'm going to say that it was a big enough mistake that in my head, I was thinking something different, and the words that came out of my mouth just didn't add up. And that oftentimes hap happens because you have to remember that I'm out here just filming as I'm working. Right. So sometimes the gibberish that comes out of my mouth doesn't really make sense. Who knows? Right. So I know what uh, Al Anonymous and Andrew Ralph Morton pointed out. I know that was what the cause was, but I said it incorrectly. OK. Um, and I explained it kind of in the the um, the cutaway when I was opening up the compressor. But the point in the original post what, or in original video, what I had said was that I thought that or I incorrectly said that the refrigerant was going to migrate to the warm section and that's incorrect okay so with the crankcase heater is there to keep the crankcase nice and warm so that way the refrigerant doesn't just sit there inside the compressor because on startup you could have a flooded start where that refrigerant just turns on and it's already in the crankcase, right? And the scroll plates just can't handle the liquid refrigerant. So we have a crankcase heater there to try to keep all the liquid refrigerant from sitting there and migrating and sitting inside that compressor. Now, compressors can operate and they do with flooded start. Usually you see a lot of the scroll galling inside there if it's had a lot of flooded starts, but this one was bad enough that I think, and I think a flooded start was the cause, but I think it was bad enough that it broke that old ham coupling and uh, broke the tab of the orbiting scroll, right? And, you know, I, I had originally said that I thought it was liquid refrigerant coming back. There's still a possibility that liquid refrigerant coming back, but like I mentioned when I was taking the compressor apart, the only way that really liquid refrigerant enough in my head would come back is if it was operating with no belt on the unit. But even still, if it was operating with no belt, you would think that the low pressure control would cut it out before uh, you know it comes back. But I have to think back, does this thing actually have a low pressure control? Or does it just have a loss of charge switch? Huh, that's a good question. I don't know. I'll have to review the footage and go and see. If it has a loss of charge switch and a high pressure control, well, then it's perfectly feasible that uh, it would run without a belt and then just jam that compressor full of liquid refrigerant. And still, it could have been part of the problem. But more than likely, the answer is it was a flooded start issue because the crankcase heater was bad also. And the fact that the crankcase heater was bad, it's there to prevent liquid migration to the compressor, right? And to prevent the flooded starts. 
So the fact that it had a bad crankcase heater and the old ham coupling had broken inside the compressor leads me to think that more than likely the cause of the failure was a flooded start situation. That's what I'm thinking, right? But again, I digress. I am not the best service technician. I don't know every single thing out there, okay? I just try my best, right? I really appreciate y'all making it to the end of the video, and I have to say thank you again to Al Anonymous and Andrew Ralph Morton. I had to write their names down because both of you were the two comments that really stood out to me when I read them, and I try to read the comments as much as possible. So if you all have feedback, I am 100% open to it. You can shoot me an email, hvacrvideos at gmail.com. You can leave a comment in the video, wherever it may be. Do so, and give me feedback. If you think I did something incorrectly, if you think I said something incorrectly, or you want some more information, feel free. I mean, again, I am an open book. I'm totally open to criticism, um, all that good stuff. So I appreciate and I thank both of those gentlemen that had sent those comments because, and I'm glad you guys sent them right away because I just, every once in a while, I'll look at the video as after I post it and I happen to notice, huh, that's an interesting long comment. And so then I read it and it's like, oh my gosh, did I, and I had to go back and rewatch the video to see what I had said and I made a mistake, right? So I'm not perfect. I'm just another human being. Again, thank you so very much to both of you, okay? If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. Uh, it's another great way to help support the channel, okay? But the easiest way to support this channel is literally just watch the videos from beginning to end. That really is the easiest way, okay? You can also go to my website, hvacrvideos.com, where we have merchandise available, hats, beanies, sweatshirts, all that good stuff. You can also support the channel via Patreon, PayPal, or YouTube channel memberships. There's links in the show notes. Those are all monthly commitments that you can make, and it just charges your credit card however much money you want. You can donate to the channel that way. Last but not least, you can go to truetechtools.com. If you go to truetechtools.com, you see some of the tools that I use, check out their website. I have an offer code, big picture, one word. If you use my offer code at checkout, majority of the items on their website, you'll get an 8% discount, and then I get a small commission from that. Now, there's a few things that that discount code doesn't apply to, but for the most part, big picture, one word, will get you an 8% discount on majority of the items. Again, thank you so very much, and please, 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 if you guys have feedback, criticism, praise, whatever it may be, shoot me an email, hvacrvideos at gmail.com. Leave me a comment. I'm 100% open to it, and I really, really do appreciate it because sometimes my brain doesn't work correctly, and I don't vocalize the things that I'm thinking or I say things incorrectly. Again, I'm just a normal service tech out there working and just happen to turn my phone on and you know just babble. And for whatever reason, you guys choose to listen. So I really do appreciate you, and uh, we will catch you on the next one.